Jay Morris, and you are about to embark on the next Pioneer Knowledge Services Because You Need to Know, a digital resource for you to listen to folks share their experience and knowledge around the field of knowledge management and nonprofit work. If your company or organization would like to help us continue this mission and sponsor one of our shows, email byntk at pioneer-ks.org. Hi, everyone. My name is Neil Wagner, and I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So where is that, you might ask? Calgary is about 60 miles, for you Americans, east of the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. I would say that there are two interesting things that people would be aware of. Number one, Calgary is where a lot of the TV series, The Last of Us, was filmed. A lot of people don't know that, but I'm hearing a lot of references to that. Not that I've ever seen that, any of the shows yet, but it was filmed here. Secondly, Calgary was also the home of the 1988 Winter Olympics. The field I work in, I work in technology. I work as a CIO for some organizations that are usually not-for-profit organizations. And I work as a senior strategist slash program director and sometimes project manager in the for-profit world. At the moment, the organization that occupies most of my time is a not-for-profit called the Calgary Counseling Center. And I would also tell you that my most fantastic job slash work experience was as a doc boy when I finished high school in Quebec. You finished high school in grade 11. And yes, I worked at a yacht club for the summer. It was a fun time. We're here today to really discuss the challenges. Organizations, apparently, doesn't matter the scale or breadth of an organization, the challenges they have with digitizing their organization or having a strategy in any of that to get technology done. Neil is here and he's going to tell us some kind of behind the scenes, what he's seen and things that he's observed. So Neil, tell me what's the saddest thing you ever saw in an organization just was not doing their technology well? The saddest situation that I've seen happen just recently in the last six months where I was engaged with an organization trying to do what I do, um, a for-profit company, very successful in what they do. When I asked the CIO, actually suggested that it was actually time for them to put a stake in the ground and state what their IT strategy was, I was told that now's not the time to establish a strategy, which you could have knocked me over with a feather because it explained everything in, in one sentence. It explained the chaos that was occurring at that organization and why it took so long for everything to get done and why everybody questioned everything. So if you're getting pushback from somebody at that level, at the command level, that says, we don't have time to worry about a strategy right now because we're too busy being us, you're just the tail wagging the dog. Yep. It was astonishing is the only uh. word that comes to mind. <laughs> it's the only word because, you know, we all have grand ideas about, hey, we should yeah. have a hybrid cloud solution. We should be in Amazon yeah. only. We have facilities across North America and I think networking should work like this. And somebody says, oh no, I think networking should be working like that. And then somebody says, why do we still have handsets and why are we still running you know, yeah. traditional telephony, why isn't it all integrated? Well, they're all great questions, yeah. but without a strategy in place, mm, there's no answer to any of those questions and there's no yeah. direction to go. I would have to assume though, the strategic piece, you don't have to be huge to have a good strategy. Oh, hell no. You don't, right? And so, I mean, and we're not talking about 400 pages in a three ring binder. I mean, if you had one pager would be helpful. In fact, if you can't, in my view, if you can't summarize your strategy in one page, I don't care how big you are. If you can't do it in one page, you failed. Because the rest is the detail. As a strategy, you can say, I am not buying one more server ever again. <laughs> That's valid, right? As a, That's a strategic statement. Whether you host your iron in Azure or Oz or Oracle data centers is irrelevant to that. That's yeah. tactical. Yeah. 
putting your stake in the ground. I could tell you that one strategy that worked for some organizations, for smaller organizations, especially the not-for-profit world, was a long time ago when we said, we can't buy PCs. We can't afford them. PCs are a thousand in Canada, a thousand dollars at the time, plus a monitor. <laughs> boy, oh boy, that's expensive. Why don't we just build that big PC on the server? And everybody gets a thin client and thin clients, you just run till they break and you throw them away and you put in another one. That was a strategy. I didn't care about the brand of server. I didn't care about the brand of thin client. The clients cared about was how the hell are we going to run this organization in a cost effective manner and still deliver everything we need to deliver? Right. That's the big question. That's the one that you have to answer first. So like I said, if you don't have a strategy stated in one page, you haven't thought through your problems. What is the biggest challenge for an organization right now that, granted, you just named a big one. If you don't have the rudder on the boat, you're just floating along aimlessly and taking whatever hits you get. If the rudder is made of the strategy, then what direction should companies be looking at now? I say that because the future proof of an organization is a costly measure. Regardless, the resource cost is always going to be there. So suck it up. It's it's mm-hmm. it's always going to be there. So don't be shocked when, mm-hmm. when the next price tag comes out. Because you know what? It's the next thing. So you're either going to get along or you're not. What keeps the boat going in the right direction? Well, that's the leadership and governance question. I think that's what you're asking. You've set your strategy, right? That means that you pointed... Uh, and it's kind of a nice way to talk about it because I'm, I love going sailing. I go on an annual sailing trip with some friends. Perfect. You've pointed your boat, taken a heading, and off you go. Well, whose job is it? Is it the helmsman's job to steer that heading? Not exactly. That's your staff. <laughs> but does your staff understand why you are on the heading you're on? And what controls have you put in place to manage so that we don't drift off of that heading? <laughs> And some of it is really kind of mundane stuff. Some of it is all about who authorizes the purchase of capital assets. The CIO or equivalent in your organization who is responsible for technology, somebody can purchase equipment without your signature and without your knowing about it, you're in a bit of trouble, right? (laughs) Because you won't be able to hold that heading, right? I mean, I'm boiling this down to some really simple issues, but... I've seen it happen. We all read DeLorean's book about how we built a factory at GM and finally had to go to the board for approval for a smokestack. It was the one item that exceeded the <laughs> his spending authority uh, when he was at GM. Well, it's kind of like that, right? Except in technology, you need a really firm hand on the rudder. And I've been with some organizations where it was exactly so that the strategy was stated uh-huh. and we all knew we were living in Azure from then on, when somebody came and said, we have to buy all these servers for such and such, and they have to be on prem. The answer was go jump in the lake. That's not happening. There were people in the organization who had a signing authority that could have authorized it, but it's all about making sure as the leader of technology in your organization that you have control over these things. They really create other more important problems to resolve. It goes like this. In one conversation I had this year, somebody said to me, well, we're going to Amazon. Everything's going to be in Amazon. And I said, oh, that, that's great. But h- how did you come to that decision? Well, just because. <laughs> and the answer is, yeah, that's not a great way to come to a decision because this is all dependent upon what business applications you're going to be putting yeah. up in those, whether it's Amazon or Azure or whatever. In the direct comparison, if I talk about Amazon versus Azure, some applications lend themselves really well to the Amazon environment and not to Azure and possibly the other way around. So like, where's the inventory? Have you broken a mental sweat and figured out what you have, what you're going to be using in the future, and where is the best home for it? How do you pick vendors? In the case where one of my clients said, yep, it's all Azure all day long, when we went to pick applications or add new ones or replace them, the big question was, do I have to spin up some virtual servers in Azure or can this be run platform as a service or software as a service, however, however you describe it, which is way less costly than spinning up servers. And so suddenly, you know, all the things being equal, you were dealing with vendors 
who were selling platform as a service and not software, traditional software that you had to put on a virtual server somewhere. You brought us to a juncture and I wanna interject here because now we're talking about operations. Now we're talking about function processes and operations of whatever the organization's supposed to be doing. The CTO or CIO has part of this effort to at least stake a claim and hopefully designing a network infrastructure enterprise solution that matches or exceeds whatever the requirements are and or future proofing of the organization's work processes. How do we get there first? That's not all on the CTO to figure out because somebody in operations has got to be, oh, wait a minute, you know, the sales force is going this way in a uh, year or two. And how do you merge all of that mess? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a layered problem. Go, it it kind of goes like this. When you're a larger organization, I'll bet you that, well, I know there are a lot of organizations that have a pretty heavy duty investment in Citrix farms, for example. Some other organizations have a heavy investment in Microsoft Hyper-V on-prem, right? As an example, one of the things that you come to realize is you're going to bump into an accountant who says, we haven't extracted the value yet of our investment in those things, so it's not time to move. Of course, being the classically trained economist that I am, I listen to those arguments and I go, that's yesterday's news. We don't make decisions based on sunk costs. Yeah. People have this emotional yeah. attachment. I can't explain it in any way. It's not rational. It's emotional, <laughs> right? We just, two years ago, we spent a million and a half dollars building out that Citrix farm. Are you telling me we're throwing it away? And the answer is, yeah, <laughs> probably, because you're not going to generate the returns you want until you change course. So, so you run it. That's a classic example of, yeah. of what you see. You know, when COVID hit, mm -hmm. as an example, there were companies who had already invested heavily in cloud technology. Everything was either in Azure or about to be in or, or yeah. Amazon. They were somewhere. Access by employees to those systems was unaffected. They could cope. There were a lot of companies who had Citrix farms, for example, that were oversized and their staff had no trouble working remotely. And then there were some where the skid marks to prevent them from going, you know, around over the cliff as they went around the curve were, were stupendous. The pressures they put on the vendors, you know, I need more servers, I need more. Yeah. This. And, and of course, right away, it's the accordion effect in a cartoon, right? One thing after another slams yep. into your rear end as you're trying to figure out how to negotiate what was unthinkable became deal with yep. it. So yeah. That's a classic example. I think another kind of example that you'll run into is let's get rid of this and let somebody else run it for us. And I'm going to pick on my favorite, okay. <laughs> my favorite item, and that's the help desk because, and there's some big names out there, right? Who do help desk and boy, oh boy, they want you to outsource everything. They want to deliver your, your PCs to your desktop. They want to keep them updated. They want all this business. And they want to respond to help desk tickets. A lot of organizations buy into that and think that if they lay off all of this help desk staff and let somebody else do it, that they're suddenly going to save a lot of money. You know, that's a mixed bag. I think some organizations have done okay with that strategy and many others have had to go, well, this didn't work. We have to hire people back. Well, there's a quality problem in a lot of that. You look at the dollars and cents and somebody's on somewhere with a slide scale says, ooh, look at the savings. That's great. Let's do that. Oh, my but gosh. But then the quality yeah. goes to the floor and you got angry customers now. So that impacts sales and la, 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 la. It just keeps going. How does an organization, now we've been talking about the big dilemma, the big technological elephant in the room for all organizations that have to face and deal with if they're going to progress in the future. How does an organization decide if you're going to hire it out or you're going to hire in somebody that has that brainiac or that technology powerhouse to come in and be your employee or outsource it? I mean, it's just, it's got to be a, a tough road either way. Yeah, it's not simple. I like to look at it this way. There are a few deciding factors about whether something stays something like help desk stays in-house or not. One of them is culture because culture trumps everything. You know, the old saying, Mark Andreessen said, software eats everything and he's right. 
except that culture eats everything else, <laughs> including, <laughs> including software. <laughs> so here's what I mean by that. Is the problem at hand inimical to the success of your organization, right? So it not, in other words, you can't cost it. You can only sense it. Of yeah. course, when the accountants get involved, they only know cost. They don't know sensing at all. But you have to dig several layers deep into the working innards of an organization to start figuring out why something cannot or should not be separated. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is a misunderstanding amongst the leadership of the service-oriented nature of the business they're okay. in. If they don't get that and if they don't care or if they service is not part of their culture, then suddenly these kinds of systems become easy candidates to punt, uh -huh. right? Really easy candidates to punt. The second question I, I always like to ask is, okay, culturally, we know what we need to do. The next question I ask is, let's suppose that we outsource something. Everybody understands what a RACI chart is, right? Or mostly, and you've heard it by different terms, RACI or RASCI, I even forget what the S stands for when they do that, but who's responsible, who's accountable, who do we consult with, and who do we inform? Yeah. That's what those letters okay. stand for. Really big in the project management world. We, all, we, we live by that chart, right? It's one of the first things you do to identify who are the players involved in this. Take that up a few notches. You know, because you can have many people responsible for something. There are a bunch of yeah. doers, right? But only one person can hold an A. Only one, right? Because that's accountable. In the hardest look, the board's going to look to the person who was accountable and say, yeah. this was you. Why did you do this this way? Or some director, lower down, or manager. Why did you do this? Why did you want this? You're being held accountable. So when you outsource something you can't outsource the a mm. ever and companies just sort of slide by that issue every time like they they just don't kind of break a mental sweat over i'm making this decision to outsource this thing help desk being the one of the most yeah. common is it the right call i'm accountable for this do i really understand the implications because you know one of the things that happens is when the outsourcing discussions start to happen your organization is typically flooded with a bunch of people from the company who's going to do the outsourcing and they're attending meetings and listening and trying to learn and all of that's wonderful but suddenly when the cord is cut <laughs> those folks are gone and they don't want to understand anymore all their motive is their only motive is to deliver the service at a cost that's less than the revenues they're charging for. That is their only motive. I don't think there is any incentive program in the world that can be reasonably calculated oh, hey. to motivate the outsourcer to provide better service for a bonus. They think they can, but I don't think they can. I just, maybe I'm just not creative enough. I think that's a, that's a big wish, a big dream. It sounds like a challenge, and I would think there's probably a profit share kind of concept that could be tagged, but I don't understand how you would rate something, especially like Help Desk. How do you calculate sales to Help Desk? You know, I, I don't know, but yeah, you you bring up a- y You know, you can. Let's skip over the Help Desk, because that's a good place to start, but let's move up the ladder now. So how does an organization get that function of a CTO, CIO, or at least somebody that's accountable for the technology of an organization, should they outsource that or should they hire on? It, again, it's a multi-layered problem. When you talk about outsourcing your technology, if you're talking about going to somebody else's data center because you don't want to run the floor space, you want to own your servers for whatever your yeah. reasons, you want to own your servers, but you don't want to be the guy running yeah. them, well, okay, there's lots of hosting centers around and you can do that. And there's a whole bunch of costs that come into play. You know, you may not have the real estate in your building to host it. You may not have the power yeah. to deliver all the air conditioning required. You Like all of these things, right? And there's lots of companies like that around. If the belief is that you have to wrap your arms around your servers and manage it that way, that's an easy call. But the next question is, well, who's servicing those machines? Who's planning for upsizing computers? Who's planning for maintenance outages? Who's planning, like suddenly that's a whole other deal. And that's sort of the IT operations side of the house. Yeah. 
maybe you could outsource that too. And maybe you could do that, you know, less expensively than doing it yourself. My impression is if your business is really steady state and with not a lot of change, maybe you can get away with that. But we've all lived with, and I think this was the biggest selling feature of going to either Amazon or Azure. The biggest selling features are, well, I don't have to spend $2,500 on a failed disk. <laughs> I, yeah. my machine is never obsolete. If suddenly all right, we've got to jump in business, I throw more RAM on it and I throw more disk at it. I can even upgrade my CPUs, but you know, in 15 minutes later, you've got capacity. Well, for a lot of companies, that's just huge. That is beyond huge. And not only, not only is it huge on the upside, but huge on the downside. Oh, you want to scale back, scale back. And there's nothing in any of these contracts that you sign with these folks, there's nothing preventing you from doing yeah. that. In fact, it's encouraged. It's part of their sales pitch. And what I find to be the most interesting part of all this, these are what I call the knock-on effects. You've made this decision to go this way and you understand as a senior, this is, there are all kinds of hidden benefits or knock-ons that you can't articulate, but they're there. A lot of companies don't see it. One of the classic conversations I had that was years ago when I was helping a not-for-profit migrate to Microsoft Mail, Exchange Mail Online, when before it was called Office 365, but the product yeah. was there. And I was sitting there with the CEO of the not-for-profit, the IT services vendor who was supporting their existing server infrastructure. This vendor was just shocked when I said, we're going to lock, stock, and barrel. It's, it's going over to Microsoft. And he said, why? This is working perfectly. And I said, well, that's not the point. But yeah, it's, it's free. And I said, no, it's not free. He says, oh, yeah, it's free. And I looked at the <laughs> tech, right? The service tech who was sitting there with the vendor. I said, how many hours a week do you spend care and feeding on this exchange server? Oh, one to two hours a week. So it's not free, right? It's not free. And yeah. they're like, but don't yeah. I have to do that if you go to? No, you don't. Right. So that's a tiny, tiny example of what's involved, but think of it on a much yeah. larger scale. And what I think is happening in the tech world that people are really starting to take advantage of is if I remove all these jobs around what I call server operations, right? Server expansion, memory, power, all of those things. What do I get to spend my money on? And the answer is higher level functions. You know, suddenly it starts to sound like the job of a server engineer is going away. And maybe it is, I don't, but m maybe it's actually turning into a much more knowledge inten intensive kind of job where you now have to have the skills to manage a virtual yeah. environment, which by the way, is no small thing, right? Somebody has to know how to do that. And, and done wrong, you're just as exposed security wise or worse than you ever were with your stuff on premise. We can pretty much bet that complexity will continue to expand in this realm, but also capacity expands as well. As things change, capacities change, processes change, abilities change. I think keeping the surfboard going in the right direction, another nautical, let's stick with the nautical. <clears throat> If you're on a surfboard and you're trying to ride that wave, you got to keep judging and moving and adjusting and the classic agile mentality of just trying to stay on the board. But here again, I'll ask, how does an organization help themselves? Let's say we're talking a small to mid-sized nonprofit that has been poking along and doing great for 20 years, but they're really at a scale execution point where they really got to start their strategic plan on technology and looking at it serious because now they're starting to really grow. What's the first and second thing they got to have in place other than strategy? Well, We've nailed that. Some minutes ago, I mentioned governance, but maybe there's a better word. Maybe the word is discipline. Ah. Back when, when I was a young lad starting out in this business, <laughs> Last week. At the Yacht Club, yes. <laughs> oh, that... PCs hadn't been invented when I was at the Yacht Club, I can assure you. But, you know, the kinds of like best practices that were drilled into us in those days was users don't get to pick products. They get to tell us what their requirements are. And, you know, that's a very big statement. Very big. 
and very impactful. The reason why it's impactful is, and again, I have the lived experience of sitting with a CEO of a not-for-profit trying to explain to this person that there are two applications in their portfolio that have to be dumped. And the reason why is cost. They're just too expensive. And the first pushback I got was, but we like these tools. <laughs> okay. I agree. You might like them, but you don't know what you're also going to like when you change. Right. And if I could promise you that we could carefully detail all the things you like, all the requirements, in other words, that you're meeting, and maybe the ones that you're ignoring that you know you have that you're not dealing with. And we found something that was, I don't know, $30,000 a year cheaper. Would you be interested? And I have had a range of responses to that question at times. Mm. One organization just was flat out, no, I think we're just going to stay with what we got, which to me was almost insulting because <laughs> this was an organization that was not, what's the word I'm looking for? It was not social enterprise. They had no invoicing going on. They were dependent on grants and donations. So what you're telling me is that you don't steward your donor's money as well as you think you do because mm -hmm. there's a solution for less. And I, I've had that same issue in their case. It was two applications. And one of them was, you know, I think it's time to put this one to sleep. It's, it's end of life anyway. The vendor's going to change it for something else. You might as well bite the bullet in your planning. And again, your migration won't be that hard because you're not invoicing. You're not a social enterprise. This is just all yep. about managing what you got. It was the same kind of pushback. It's like, yeah, you may, yeah. May, even though you put the numbers in front of them, you can show them line for line what they are spending and going to spend. Maybe they'll do it and maybe they won't. Some jump all over it, right? Don't get me wrong. Some are quite rational, but, but in terms of how do you get there, first you have to start with culture. And in this case, the culture is, listen, I want to know everything about what you need for your job, like okay. everything. Don't hold back. You start with a blue sky, right? Clean sheet of paper, tell me what you need, but you don't get to pick. I've actually had those same discussions in the for-profit world and the expense was a lot larger and the clients kept coming back to me with, we want a product like such and such. And the product they wanted that they were comparing themselves to what they thought they wanted was technologically and security wise and feature wise unfit for what they wanted, but they liked that whizzy interface. They thought that was really, really cool. cool. We love it. Yes. And how am I going to explain to these folks, I could go head to head and feature for feature and show them that there's no match. Okay. And I would get nowhere. Yeah. But the way you, I succeeded in that conversation was to figure out, okay, here's the solution we need today. I've got something that works for today and let's postpone that other decision until a little later yeah. on, right? And they went with that because there was no time. I had time on my side, not theirs. I had to execute. The second piece of what I had to do was again, start gently, gently pushing the mantra, not directly from me, but from seniors we need requirements, but there are so many other complexities around security and supportable technologies that IT will make the final yeah. call. But as long as we meet your requirements, you're good to go. And that was hugely successful. And I don't think that organization has ever looked back and said, okay, now we're going to go to that. They haven't looked at that and they'll never be allowed to, right? <laughs> There's a lot of power in saying, how about we table that for now and let's get back to that. We had a friend that used to say, We're, let's just let that rough end drag for a bit. You know, just, yeah. just don't, let's, let's just let it, and we'll, we'll come back to it. And sometimes it just evaporates right. all by itself and you didn't have to do a thing. But right. you, like you say, when you get emotions involved and people got pushback and they're like, uh, you know, and now you got cultural issues where people are, have expectations of what they think. I used to work in a line of business where sales was the primary, what my primary job was. And they taught us before we even sold that we had to help the buyer get on the road to the sale and that our job was to just ask questions. Because their concept of what they thought yes. they needed was either driven by an ad for something and, oh, wow, that looks great. But they don't know all the details. So you're just kind of like playing Columbo and just, whoa. So uh, you're just asking all these questions <laughs> and you're helping them get to a solution without you helping them get to this. Just kind of quizzing them. And 
Oh, I yeah, totally yeah. understand. I mean, it's a beautiful. And let me, let yeah. me tell you, Go ahead. the Colombo analogy is one that I actually, I used to mimic the guy except without the <laughs> trench coat. And I recall very clearly, because I also was in sales at one point, and I was taught, you're here yeah. to solve your customer's problems. And if you're not here to do that, you're not in sales. Like, you're not going to win. And I, I was running this project for a very large insurance company. We were trying to build out this. I don't want to leave any identifiable yeah, yeah. information okay. here. So I, we we're trying to build out a solution because of a major change in the way they conducted business. Okay. And it literally meant crawling through their chart of accounts on the expense side and getting an explanation on each oh line. My. Okay, where do these numbers come from? What's the process? Yeah, right? build, yeah, line yeah. by line before we could figure out what to wow. do with it. Because it could be many sources, right. right? You know, I had a great team and I would literally, I'm a sloucher in a chair anyway. This is what I naturally do. Unless I'm in the racing <laughs> position about to go for the kill. Mostly I'm listening and I'm slouched back and my eyes are literally half closed. And they said X early on in the, that day's conversation. And 15 minutes later, somebody said the opposite on a different line. And suddenly I'm doing the Columbo. Wait a minute. I got one more question. <laughs> <laughs> hold on there. Hold on. Not because I wanted to catch them out. No. That, like it's, it's not, no, it's not yeah, about no, that. It, yeah. But what you want to do is, are we all on the same page here? Because yes. I can't give you a solution yeah. if you're telling me X and Y coexist. They can't. And that, that was the classic, actually. And I remember yeah. after that meeting, my colleagues coming up to go, that was the best Columbo imitation ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's effective. You know, I think it really disarms the people around the table because then yep. you can get more towards the actual essence of the mission or the problem set or, you know what I mean? It just kind of yep. deflates some egos a bit. You come off with, yep. oh, I, I don't know. How to... Yeah. Let's, let's wrap today's discussion up with, we've talked about technology in a very grand scale. We've talked to it in application and how an organization is challenged with the internal versus outsourcing kind of concepts. If you had to sit down with a 30 something that's going to do a startup, what would you tell them really as solid advice going forward because they don't know yet. It's an untried at this point. Get back to that strategic, because I know you're going to say, you got to build the rudder first. You got to know what the hell the direction we're going. But what would you give them as a on the spot today? You're at the bus stop and you're just talking to this kid and boom, you're like, you know, the thing I would not do and the thing I would do is. Yeah. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter to me whether you're talking about building out the infrastructure for company operations or you're building out the infrastructure for a company idea, right? Like some tech idea. Doesn't matter which. My first piece of advice would be you're not ever going to buy a server. You will pick somebody's hosted service and you're not going to pick Joe Blog service from around the corner. You're going to pick one of the majors, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Oracle, Dell, one of those guys is going to have it for you. Cost is a big factor and you should be able to price this out so you know exactly what you're getting into. That's the beauty of these things. The one thing yeah. that you can't really cost are transaction volumes because a lot of stuff you do, you're built on the transaction volume. So that's the first thing I would do. My direct experience with Azure is detailed enough now that I would say you better also establish a very traditional chart of accounts for technology in your accounting system. And the reason why you want to do that is because that is how you're going to know what you're spending and which applications you're spending it on right down to transaction movements, integration costs. For one of my clients, my revised chart of accounts for IT is listed out by major application. So yeah, there's the whole, there's a bucket for Microsoft 365, but it breaks it out into security yep. and office applications. For example, there's sub accounts there as examples. When I look at application support, I know who my vendors are that support these applications and they get posted into accounts and sub accounts unique mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. application. Then when I look at my subscriptions from Azure, Okay, what's going on in Azure? They break out the same way so that everything posts into accounting in such a way that if I'm looking for my costs for 
client relationship management, for example, I know ongoing support costs are, I know what the development costs are, I know what the subscription costs are because yeah, it's yeah. running as platform as a service in Azure. Like, and I can summarize it that way, and which is really important because one day somebody in your organization is going to ask yeah, you, yeah. how much does X cost? And you know the old yeah. saying, you have to know your numbers. It's not hard. This took me, you know, this is a pretty complicated organization. It probably took me off and on three weeks of experimentation to figure out exactly how to do what I wanted to do. So it's not hard, but if you do it from the start with uh, this yeah. is the way we're going to do it, later on, you're golden yeah. because you can answer those questions and nobody can tell you, oh, your help desk system is too expensive. Exactly. Oh, hell yeah. no. I know exactly. You know, what are you kidding me? That's, that's not where we spend our money. It's interesting you're bringing this up because it sounds like there's a challenge for most organizations, CFOs, to know all of that level of fidelity you're talking about, right? Because I, I assume that there's a capital expense somewhere and you're like, oh, we got to spend $60,000 on X. We got to, okay, so the CFO, okay, we got that, that budget lines in there. But I can't imagine they've gone to all these little teeny details of tracking all these little minute things that add up to the big number because one nobody's probably actually followed the trail down like you did and two the expectations probably not there either you know it's like oh well, well it's a monthly service fee and you know or transaction yeah easy to overstate and under show i i hear you and and the answer is i'm making it sound maybe simpler than it really is yeah. for smaller companies you know this is very easy to yeah, do yeah yeah when you're a big company and you have 3000 applications in your portfolio you know you don't want 3000 line items in your chart of accounts right for just just for piddly applications yeah, that don't yeah. cost very much so you do end up with like a common bucket for a lot of things okay. no question okay um, but some of that is actually tied as well. <laughs> this is what's so crazy. Well, what mechanisms are you actually going to be implementing to accept invoicing from your vendors? Because if you haven't automated that, well, you're still in the soup, yeah, right? Yeah. And don't tell me, well, you got a fax to, or an email account to pick up <laughs> these, <laughs> these invoices. Yeah. That's no oh, good, boy. right? Yeah. Like that's oh, the news that's, of yeah. 20 years ago, you know, and I don't care yeah. if it's blockchain or if it's uh, an Ariba Networks kind of solution, but you got to do something, right, to pick that up because nobody yeah. should be touching those things yeah. from the data entry side. Somebody has to be reviewing it to make sure it's uh -huh. right, but nobody should be hand bombing anything. That when you're a large organization, that, that's hard, right? That becomes a problem, but with a huge payoff. Don't think yeah. for a minute that that's one of those problems that should just be kind of, well, it'll be, you know, we'll just hire clerks. Hiring clerks isn't the answer. <laughs> the answer is the cost of managing points of data can get very, very high if you don't figure out its life from beginning to end. We are in the technology business yeah. anyway. If we can't figure out how to automatically move yeah. that data along, we don't deserve yeah. our jobs. It comes to that. So th that's the advice I would yeah. give somebody. You actually need a strategy. You actually need a CFO who understands something about technology. But oh, by the way, your CIO should not ever, ever report to your CFO. Don't don't Man, be hold. that. Don't do that. That's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of a, an analogy that would make sense and none comes to mind. But there's such vastly different roles and one is not subordinate to the other. They are complementary. You know, the old yeah. days where CIOs reported to accounts was because, well, you know, that was the biggest line item in the technology expense and the accounting data was the biggest chunk of data. So sure, that made sense. You, the accountant owned all yeah. that crap. That's not true anymore. And in fact, the fastest way to not be able to extract value from your financials is to give it <laughs> to a traditional accountant who has no idea what you want as a manager, as a director for a management report, right? They don't know. Yeah. And, and do they want to? Like the bigger no, the organization, no. yeah. the less they're inclined to even want to know about that. That's a totally different patch of problems. Yeah. <laughs> so your, your infrastructure had better be set up in such a way as to accommodate 
both those guys, right? Your CIO and your CIO. Thanks for sharing all this great nautical advice. <laughs> I appreciate the technological advice and the inside mind of Neil Wagner and his vast <laughs> experience and doing lots of things. And I appreciate it, Neil. Edwin, this is always fun to be with you. Always fun. Thank you very much. Take care. You have just finished our latest Because You Need to Know, a public service of Pioneer Knowledge Services. Please join us on LinkedIn and find us at pioneer-ks.org.